Hello, everyone, and welcome to OHSCA Interviews. I'm Vincenzo Calla, and I'm your host for today's episode. Today, I'm happy to have with me the MP for Elgin Middlesex London, Karen Vecchio. Karen was first elected as the MP for Elgin Middlesex London in 2015 and was re-elected in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. Prior to entering politics, she owned and operated a small business in London, Ontario, and worked alongside former Member of Parliament and current Mayor of St. Thomas, Ontario, Joe Preston, as his executive assistant for 11 years. Karen currently serves as the Shadow Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth and the Chair of the Standing Committee on the Status of Women in Parliament. Um, thank you, Karen, for your time today, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. We're glad to have you here today, and we're going to start off the interview with our question and answer segment. These questions come from the sure. members of our high school team. So the first question is uh, kind of a reflection question, and it's what did you learn while working for former MP Joe Preston that you have been able to apply uh, to your job as an MP over the past uh, six, seven years well, you know, I, I can reflect and think about all of the different lessons and all of the different things that I learned from Joe working with him for the 11 years, and not only in his role as uh, MP, but now in his role as the mayor of St. Thomas as well, and, and he's been doing that for a number of years. So not only his job as an MP, but moving forward. And, you know, it's really about listening. That's something that I really learned from him. He used to always say, there is your side the other side, and then the truth. And I always keep that in mind. And as the chair of Status of Women, he too was the chair of the Procedures and House Affairs Committee. And he said, it's just so important to, to know what the finish line, know what the goal is, and how you're going to get the team there. And that has so much to do with listening and just ensuring that everybody um, is on board. So those are some of the things, like, first of all, making sure that you listen to everything. And then also making sure that when you're listening, that you understand that there's many sides to issues. And so always getting um, getting down to and dig, digging deeper so you can always get down to the truth. Well, that's so true. And I mean, I think today, nowadays, it's, it's really um, hard to get, uh, well, I mean, sometimes it's hard to see the one-sided truth because we all come from different backgrounds and we all see different things. And that's all fantastic stuff. But sometimes, uh, sometimes the truth is sort of buried and we have to find it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing sometimes because when you look for the truth, you get to learn so much, but sometimes it's just kind of misinformation is a problem too. So true. And everything is so subjective, right? And and what I really look at are things like the gender-based analysis. We talk a lot about that GBA plus. And I take that and go further and think, start thinking about where are people from? Did they immigrate to Canada or have they been here for years? Do they live in Western BC or, or do they live in Northern Alberta compared to somebody in Southern Ontario? And recognizing that we all have different experiences. And it's not just your education that creates who you are, but it's those experiences. So get Getting the opportunity to speak to people and, and hearing from them, especially on their experiences in my role, is really important. For sure. And it's it's probably something that's really beneficial to you as well. I mean, as, yeah. as in your role, in your roles. Um, yeah. So we're going to move on to the next question. And this question doesn't come from a member, but it comes from, I guess you could say, a friend of OHSCA. And he's one of your constituents, a young person, um, Darian from St. Thomas. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I reached out to him the other day and he had a question for you. And he wanted to ask, as an MP, how do you maintain a balance between the interest of your riding of Elgin Middlesex London and the interest of the party of the CPC? How do you balance those together as a, as a role, as an MP? Well, I think that's a really important question. And I think that's what caucus is all about. So every Wednesday, of course, every Wednesday, we have our regional caucus meetings, and then we have our national caucus meetings. And you'll see that with all of the national parties in, in government or in parliament, that opportunity to voice what you're thinking of. And that is something that as a part of the CPC, we have that. If there is a question that you have, you get up to the mic and you ask it in front of your peers. And if there's more, you, you can go to the shadow minister, you can go to the leader. There's so many opportunities 
opportunities. I know that there are some really, really important issues uh, for me. I'm working really uh, a lot on violence against women. And so for me, making sure that my voice is being heard on this is really, really important. And I just do so by going up to the mic and talking about these policies. And it's awesome because, you know, as soon as we're done, I swear those emails, those phone calls start coming from, uh, from other people that have been inspired by you talking and saying, hey, let's meet about that. And so that's what I think is really phenomenal about our party. We're probably one of the only parties that has an open Q&A seg uh, Q segment during caucus. I know that for other, uh, one of the other, the governing party, you just don't have the opportunity to stand up and ask a question. It has to be um, approved and, and go on the House agenda. That's not the way our party works. And um, for better or for worse, I think it makes us a much, much stronger and more open and transparent uh, caucus. Well, definitely. And I mean, I think that uh, something that I've been talking with, uh, with different people that have come on the show, leadership candidates and members of parliament and whoever has come on the show over the past couple of weeks and months, um, I've really been emphasizing how, and I think a lot of people are starting to see this too, as more policy gets bounced around during a leadership race, obviously new ideas come about. There's always going to be some sort of conservative um, uh, conservative solution to, to different problems and beliefs. Now, there may mm -hmm. be some things that aren't necessarily something that we've championed for a long time, but there are things that we can find conservative ways to. The best example is probably climate change. Um, obviously, we have a different climate change um, policy from the Liberals or from the NDP, but it's just, it's, it's strong and it's just a conservative version of it. And we saw this in the election and hopefully we're going to see it more coming forward, but being able to have that conservative uh, version of something that is just as strong and in line yeah. with what we believe in. Yeah. And you know, something, I think it's really important too, because when we talked about that regional difference, um, you know, climate change is something that is very, is, is looked at very differently and rural versus urban is definitely there. I was out last night with district five of the grains and oil seeds for Ontario and their fuel costs between 2020 and 2021 went up 25%. They're expecting the same climb for the 2021, 2022 comparison as well. And that's because of, you know, additional taxes and things like that. And that's to do with their climate change policies. Um, the impact on rural residents is very different than what you find in the urban centers. So we have to see what's beneficial. And then that can, it can get into the entire discussion about supply chains, food security, and everything like that. Something that we have to recognize um, the impact on the food costs is part to do with, with policies that we have at the federal, uh, the federal government level. Well, definitely. And I mean, um, those are all issues and all uh, things that have been put more into focus nowadays. I mean, uh, especially with uh, trying to figure out, OK, uh, well, the rising price of things, um, oh. looking at uh, uh, that's a whole other conversation we could have. But uh, looking at buying local and seeing mm -hmm. what's the best alternative and looking local and and uh, it's a whole bunch of things that I don't want to get sure. into because we could talk for hours about it. Absolutely. So, um, right now, I'd like to go on to sort of a question that uh, a lot of people in the party and even a lot of Canadians who aren't necessarily conservative voters are thinking about right now. And it's just personal opinion on, on your behalf. And uh, we had an election in the past two elections for the conservatives have been quite successful. We got popular votes. We had a lot of seats. And it's a question about um, what do you think that the CPC has to prioritize to do and win the next election, whenever that may be, if there's maybe one thing that you think that the party should do or a policy maybe that should be highlighted. I wish I could say it was just one thing, but I think there's many things that Canadians are looking for when they're electing governments. So, you know, I knew in this election, some of the key policies, well, a lot of time, fiscal responsibility and management, that is one of the key issues that as conservatives, we come out with good policies, we come out with things that are are working for families and small businesses. So those are positive things that we can do. But you know, it depends on who I'm speaking to and it depends on what that voter age and demographic is. Um, so for instance, if I'm speaking to a farmer, their, their needs are gonna be different than a student and that's gonna be different than a senior. Uh, but having good fiscal policy is something that binds us all together. But I know with uh, because I also have youth in my portfolio, I look at some of the key objectives and see, see some of the key priorities being brought forward by the youth groups and climate change is definitely always in the top three. The cost of living is one of those because of the cost of living, whether it's the cost of tuition or housing or 
whatever it may be, you know, the cost of, uh, you know, residence, uh, all of those things and uh, are really, really important to students, but they also worry about what's going to happen when they graduate and what housing is going to look like. Uh, once again, comes down to fiscal responsibility and fiscal policy. And so I think with as the Conservatives, I always say we're the engine about the economy being the engine for the entire country. And um, that's what I see as a strong Conservative policy that binds us all together. And I think that's really what people are looking for right now. Well, especially, well, that that's definitely something. I mean, especially now um, we see, as I mentioned before, uh, inflation and uh, the rising house prices and just the impossible market. Um, I know that on the conservative benches in the house right now, uh, a lot of people, um, I remember seeing the clip by your colleague, uh, Melissa Lansman, yes. uh, about uh, what happens if people don't have parents that are rich or talking about the billboard she saw in Toronto. Uh -huh. And it's it's something that needs to be prioritized. And that all ties in, like you said, that ties in with fiscal responsibility. And even climate change ties in with fiscal responsibility. Absolutely. All of these things come down to if we have a strong economic engine, then we can help out with uh, the social safety net. Some of these programs, when it's poverty reduction, when it's women's issues, all of these things. But if we don't have a strong economy, we cannot support these programs that are necessary. Climate change is something that we have to deal with. It's definitely one of the key issues and priorities for parliamentarians, but we have different ways of looking at it. And I think that um, right now, the way that it's being done with the carbon tax actually has a negative impact on our gross domestic product when it comes to, especially in my writing, food security and, and food production. Well, yeah, I mean, just because there's a carbon tax doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to move a lot of people away from using gas. I mean, some people, uh, mm -hmm that it's good for them that they get to just get up and go and buy an electric car to avoid the carbon tax. But that's not a realistic uh, thought for a majority of Canadians, uh, especially, well, yeah. Well, I was gonna say the carbon tax isn't just about the gasoline you put in. It's also about the fact that that tomato that's been shipped up um, or the stuff that's been shipped across Canada does have uh, a carbon tax applied to the fuel in, you know, whether it's on a train or whether it's by plane, that there is an additional cost. So the carbon tax is applied to everything from that pair of pants that you're wearing to the apple that you're eating, because there is transportation costs that are always included in these things. So we can't just look at it as consumer, but we also have to look at it through the supply chain. And it's direct and indirect, right? I mean, like, I, I know that the finance minister talks about how inflation is a global phenomenon. And fair point, it is a lot of uh, every country is dealing with it. But there are things that our government can do to sort of try and chip away at it and try to make things as affordable as they can for Canadians and add the carbon tax to inflation, uh, well, the impacts of the carbon tax to inflation, and it'll only be worse. Yeah, well, we're, I know that uh, with the, the war going on in Ukraine, we know that there are some issues at the pumps. We know that there has been increases in the gas, but we're, right here, it's $1.80 to fill up. Um, that's just, I'm sorry, this there's no reason for it to be so expensive. Um, we know so much of that is tax. The excise tax, of course, there's increases of that that just happened on April 1st and it increased in the carbon tax. So if we actually drill down to what the cost of the good is versus the taxes, I think many consumers would be just absolutely mortified to see how much the government is getting. Definitely, and we had, uh, we had Lisa Radon, your former colleague Lisa yes, Radon, a couple of course. weeks ago, and we talked about that, about uh, how much the government gets and that uh, the carbon tax really helps line their pockets more than anything. Uh, sure and does. how, uh, well, we see with uh, Ontario, Ontario and Premier Ford are starting to, to take away the gas taxes to at least alleviate some of the pressures, but they can only do so much. They can mm -hmm. take some away, but who knows, the federal government might step in and boost it back up sort of the way things happen. Um, well, things happen, obviously that's politics, but but uh, it's, it really is uh, something that I think everybody needs to be on the same page on and recognize, I okay, agree. what's necessary and what's not necessary. I agree. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the next question. And it's talking about, it's sort of a deeper topic and, it ta and it's a bit reflective on your, um, on your position as the, minister, uh, the shadow minister for youth. And uh, actually it's, it's something that um, is, is an issue and obviously, uh, Hopefully, uh, well, I know that our party is starting to look at, um, well, I'll just say the question and then I'll do the follow-up. So um, 
Evan from Ottawa wants to ask, how can we stop the spread of drugs around youth? And in which ways can we improve their mental health that is impacted by drugs? And I know that uh, we had Mike Lake on uh, last uh, fall. To, he's the shadow minister for addictions and uh, mental health. And we talked a bit about this, uh, about uh, mental health and addictions, but maybe in your position as the shadow minister for youth, how can we, uh, what's your uh what do you have to say about that? Uh, well, you know, Vincent, this is something that is really close to my heart as well, because we know that we've watched through COVID. We've seen um, we've seen an increase in suicides. We've seen an increase in addictions um, and the use of drugs through this period of time as well. You know, it is such a phenomenon that we're going through, and it's not an easy fix. Um, 2022 budget has put in money when it comes to prevention and safe injections and things of that sort. But this is a much bigger picture because when I'm speaking to youth, we have to look at the hope. So this is a mental health crisis that we're going through with the opioid crisis as well, because people turn to drugs for a reason. Um, in many cases, it's filling a void. So this is a very large mental health challenge that we are going through. We need to see the supports um, in our communities. Right now, as the Shadow Minister for Women and Gender Equality, and as well as the Chair of Status of Women, we're, we just finished up a really important study, and it was on intimate partner violence. And we talked a lot about the intergenerational trauma. We, we talk a lot about that when we're talking about Indigenous families, but we see that happening in families across Canada, and, and, and those are things that we need to talk about. Um, what's happening to children? Uh, we talk about coercive behavior, and we have to recognize that children, and many times when they're coming from an abusive home, counseling may not be available to them immediately. Uh, the resources are very lacking, but that child has been traumatized, and there's nobody there that is helping them with healthy relationships. We do know that we have some school programs that are sometimes focusing maybe not on the right topics, but should really be talking about consent and, and um, understanding one's, one's rights. And I think sometimes um, we miss the opportunity to help bring awareness, to help educate and to help heal so many people. So I look at the hand in hand issues with violence and mental health issues with the drug addiction. Because a lot of times when you're talking about the people on the streets, there is a story and that person has a story on onto what got them there. We're looking at a lot of it. There is poverty, of course, out there. And we do know that there are some people displaced from their homes due to the cost of living right now. But many of the people that are on the streets are relying on that next fix, are relying on that uh, the drug to get away from what happened the day before, or, or in some cases, what happened to them 10 to 15 years ago or 20 or 30 years ago. And we're seeing an ever increase where the average age of a homeless person is not necessarily an 18 year old boy, but we're seeing older men as well, 40 and 50 year old men. And, and you're seeing older than that too, but it's such a crisis here. We need to do this right. And I, I really feel that we are not focusing on how to be prevent the addictions, how to be prevent the use. Um, I think that when they came out with the marijuana legislation, it was, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to get weed and it's going to be uh, all happy, joyful. But they forgot talking about that. They never brought the education part in. And regardless of what you believe, like myself, I believe it marijuana can be a gateway drug. And that has to do with more of a person and their personality and their ability to open to addictions. Because as we're studying this, we really need to look at the psychiatry of this as well. And so when I look at addictions as a whole, I think about the trauma and how we need to stop the trauma and somebody turning to, uh, to drugs. So I really want to focus on that prevention piece, that early piece. And I know a lot of those addictions do start because of a person losing hope having trauma in their life, um, abuse, and those types of things. So we need to have the resources there at the very beginning and not just at the end when somebody needs that great help that they need that we see on the streets. Right now, we need to do both because we are in a phenomenon. We are in an epidemic itself with addictions. So we need to focus on that. But we need to do that in parallel with the piece on prevention. And that comes with, uh, uh, that comes with proper... Um, proper prevention, proper education, and proper resources to help those in need at the time. Well, definitely, and very well said. I mean, there's not, um, I mean, we saw in the pandemic that, uh, well, especially in the peak of the pandemic, there was a lot of drug use. There was a lot of uh, people turning to addictions. And um, 
and obviously that was a, a lot because of um i guess lockdowns and the impact they had on people especially in the early days people mm-hmm. weren't sure what to do they were alone sometimes they sometimes didn't have anybody to turn to and there was yeah. no safe space the safe mm-hmm. space were gone and sometimes those are the schools and the teachers that know these students they were stuck in a home for some for some, up to two years sometimes with an abuser or sometimes in a toxic environment well yeah and i mean <laughs> i think that like you said we need to i mean sort of not target but we need to look at both ends of it we need to figure out how we can help the people that currently have an addiction and we also have to look at the root of the problem and yeah. figure out how how these addictions come to light and how we can can fix that and do what we can to help um avoid some of those addictions if you can absolutely say. how many people that we can prevent from getting into the drugs the drug phenomenon yeah. definitely and and i guess we'll, we'll leave it at that for for that question because it yeah. was just so perfectly said and we're going to move on to the last little part which is called advice for the next generation that we we uh talk about youth involvement in politics and we're in, we ask this to everybody that comes on our show so um the question that we like to ask everybody is um what do you think young high school conservatives can do in order <laughs> to get more politically active and one piece of advice that you would like to give them Well, you know, I think one thing is being proud to be a conservative, especially if you're a youth. Um, I remember back in the 80s, I would have people come up to me from the young liberals, and they knew I was a YPC back in 1985. And they'd want to debate me. And I would just kind of like, ugh, ugh. But I think the thing is, we have to be willing to stand up for our values. We have to be proud of who we are, because I think sometimes we may be, as a party, looked at as traditional or, you know, the fiscal side. But I think that people have to understand the importance of that, um, that it's not just about being traditional. And it's not just be, um, you know, you don't have to be a 50 year old male to think this way. But these types of responsible methods are really important. I think that we we have to be proud of who we are. And so as a young conservative, don't be fearful to debate uh, because I think sometimes we feel like uh, we're being overpowered by wokeness or being overpowered by other things. But, you know, we have something to say as well. So always make sure that we do it with with uh, our knowledge and um, support and with great respect. So anyone getting into politics, anyone who wants to have these things, have respectful conversations and don't be don't be scared to share what you're thinking. Definitely. And that's some some great advice. I mean, I know that um as a young person in politics, especially as a young conservative in politics, sometimes it can be intimidating to see sometimes, um, especially a lot of young people, um, there's a lot of young people who tend to be more liberal or NDP, and that's mm-hmm. obviously a sort of, um, I guess, a perception of society and uh, I guess the way society sort of works and um, sort of the, the backgrounds and um, yeah. what happens and, and that's okay. I really, like I like to say, I like, as I really like to enjoy it, I enjoy talking to any young person who's involved in politics anyway. Exactly. And although we may be different, you need to just uh, look at the idea of, hey, this is actually another young person who, Mm -hmm. although we may have different beliefs, actually wants to get involved in politics and being a proud conservative and, uh, and just sort of looking at it that way and, and uh, just, yeah, like that. (laughs) I think what I saw, especially because I've been involved with Equal Voice and Daughters of the Vote, we've seen in the past, um, I know that they are working hard, Equal Voice is working hard to make sure that this doesn't ever happen. But we see bullying, we see things like that, especially if you're a conservative and you have a bunch of people that do not support what you believe in. Um, they're, the ability to um, to make somebody feel uncomfortable and intimidated is very, very common, especially to young conservatives. And so I think it's really, really important to stand your ground to be proud of who you are. I've spoken to many, many young women who are conservatives who don't feel comfortable saying that they are because they feel that they get attacked. I think we can always respond with a very positive and respectful tone and be proud of our values. Definitely. And that's such a great way to, to, to end off the interview and a great note to have the interview end on. So thank you, Karen, for your time today. Thank you. We really appreciate you being with us. And thank you so much for joining us. And we wish you well in the future and, and many uh, things that you do in Parliament. And uh, I guess it's a little early to say this. We don't know when the next election is, maybe 2025, <laughs> if the Liberals and the NDP stay with their deal. But I guess um, 
good luck in your next election whenever that is as well and just (laughs) thank um, you so much Vincent thank thank you so much and that's it we hope you enjoyed today's interview look for more videos coming soon make sure to follow our Twitter Instagram Facebook TikTok accounts at Ontario Just Cons for info about our next interview and for more great content look at our website at OntarioJustConservatives.org to see more about us see our projects and for more great content and also um uh, a note if you're interested in seeing our uh, provincial election coverage go visit ohscavotes.com to look at that and uh, we'll also have uh, conservative leadership coverage there after the provincial election is done so thanks uh, so much youtube viewers make sure to like this video subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a video podcast listeners follow us and stay updated with new episodes we hope to see you all soon thank you